on you? What's on your shirt? Well, it's on my shirt. It's really good. I can't, I can't FPA, yeah. I say the golf part, but what's FPA? St. Anthony. St. Anthony. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, yeah, it's time to get rolling. I have accounted for everybody, I think. Um, before we do anything, I got some uh, email messages from you guys about this quiz two thing, about going in and uh, finding peer-reviewed sources, copying that down. Uh, one question was, to, instead of uh, selecting it and copying it and pasting it on to a Word doc or a PDF, could you do screenshots? I could do that. Just make sure how you load them and that you have everything in the screen. That was a good question. I got another question too, and some of you asked if you could change the artwork. First one, basically what you like. And I'm understanding that at least from what, what I'm hearing is that some of you aren't finding as much on these artworks. So, could you change it? The answer is yes. You could change it as long as the artwork you do the research on is in the textbook. Because we're still centered around that textbook, and that's kind of a good marker. Those are the most researched, the most famous, the most, how should I say this, the works in the most prestigious galleries. If you ever notice where these things are, they're typically at the Louvre, the Prado, the Uffizi in Florence, the Met in New York, Chicago Art Institute, and so on. And when these works belong in those collections, when they're a part of those museums' collections, it is really kind of a, an open invitation. They encourage scholars to come there and write about those works. And in fact, if you have a art history PhD, that's a, actually a pretty good place to get a job is to research their collection. And so that's why you see a lot of that in the textbook, you see a lot of that in um in the the journals so anyway any other questions before so this is class i was going to ask you about the super bowl and stuff but you know i guess baroque art will do this is a time period it's basically 17th century, the 1600s, basically Baroque. And this one's divided up Baroque in Italy and Spain. And then like we've seen heretofore, there is Baroque in the Northern European countries. And there's something that's kind of a, a dead giveaway here, I should say. Italy and Spain don't have, you see the map here, right? It's the Vatican. There's the dead, dead giveaway. These are the Catholic countries in Europe, Spain and Italy. And as I was explaining last week about how Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation kind of split Europe into two religious camps, if you will. And subsequently, two different kinds of art emerged because basically religion still influences the artwork, whether it's religious art or it's art about 
the population, whether it's uh, secular art, it's still it's still driven by the culture. And so anyway, this is divided up along these lines and pretty much for that reason. And so the Baroque, 1600s, Italy and Spain, This word Baroque is the punchline of many jokes. If you're around art historians, they have their own kind of jokes. Like, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. Just say. Vatican City center of Catholicism, and much of what is what we see today as the Vatican was built in the 1600s. Pretty much started in Renaissance, high Renaissance times, but we see this Vatican City, St. Peter's Plaza, and oftentimes when you see things like the Pope addressing the congregation, People come in through here and they gather in here and in the plaza and the Pope will speak from the balcony here from St. Peter's Basilica, right there, address the crowds. Obelisk. How many of you remember Egyptian art history? What is an obelisk? from Star Wars. It's like something that Obi-Wan Kenobi made. He made an obelisk. Not really. Let me show you the obelisk right there. It's an Egyptian. It's an Egyptian style, oftentimes directly from Egypt. It's a kind of stella. A stella is a stone marker or monument. The Stella, we still see those around a lot, actually. It comes to our time and this country as, say, gravestones. Go through a cemetery. All of those gravestones, whether it's just a plain marker with the name on it, or you'll see that there'll be statues and things, angels or a cross or a star David or something. That's a stella. And it goes back to ancient Egypt. And it's long. It's tall. And... A lot of these that you find in Europe were actually taken right out of Egypt. And a lot of them still have hieroglyphic markings on them. So that's pre-Christian time. And you can see here, there's the St. Peter's Basilica here. And this is where the crowds would gather. There are the tour buses. And so, yeah, the Pope would address people right there. But they start with the Vatican. I talk about the Reformation, the great split of the Christian church in Europe. One of the things that happens after the Reformation, and let's start with the year 1600, the Pope decides that all these Northern Europeans, they split away. They followed Martin Luther. They're in part of the Protestant Reformation. They're in the Church of England or they're Lutherans or something. And it's time that we, in the Roman Catholic Church, build a capital, a capital worthy of what they would call the true Christian faith. It's kind of a power display. It's kind of a kind of a same kind of display that we still see actually happening in this day and age. Of course, what they did then 
look like this. But today, I mean, America, the 1920s and 30s, 40s and 50s, they wanted to project American power. So what did they do? They built the world's tallest buildings, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building. And in the early 70s, Chicago, the Sears Tower. And in the 70s, when Chicago started building the tallest building, New York responded, responded by building the World Trade Towers, unfortunately destroyed by terrorists flying airplanes. But that, that's an idea of a display of power. And you can do that through architecture. You can do a lot of things through art and architecture is really quite a powerful way of projecting power, the sense of importance. And so, so the Pope, they decide they're gonna build, they're gonna put buildings out. A lot of these existed, but some of them, see there's a Sistine Chapel right off to the side. Uh, But they built this. This is 1647, 1652. The ecstasy of St. Teresa, the Cornero, the Cornero Chapel in Rome, Santa Maria del Vittoria, Rome, Italy, marble. This is what it looks like. So, so the Catholic Church decides they are going to build the most beautiful, the most Christian, the most impressive art and architecture in the world was their goal. And this guy here, Gian Lorenzo Bernini, uh, he's like the big, huge, best sculptor in Rome at the time. And so you see, this is what it looks like up close. And this is like so famous. It's like really, really. It's so it's marble. Got these brass rods behind there. What does that represent? Divine light coming down, God blessing. And I showed you Tintoretto and some of the other uh, mannerist painters that started messing around, if you don't mind me using that word, messing around with halos. And so we saw like in Tintoretto's Last Supper, it wasn't a disc. Halo, it was beams of light emanating. And a lot of the Northern European artists were doing that and it wasn't limited to sculpture. And this is something that Bernini picks up on. Now you gotta know the story of this. Anybody know the story of St. Teresa of Avila? Uh, so, a lot to learn here. This is an angel. An angel doing God's work, and he has a spear. And the way it looks here, it looks like he's going to kill her, doesn't it? doesn't it? But that's not really what's happening. What's happening here is St. Teresa of Avila was a Christian, Catholic, mystic. She was somebody who well, she's a saint, Saint Teresa of Avila. She, she was said to have seen, seen God. She was somebody who actually wrote about her spiritual experiences. In fact, she has volumes of her work. Uh, she was basically a religious mystic scholar. 
from Spain. Avalos in Spain, mind you. And she suffered some persecution. People didn't quite understand uh, what she was doing. One of the, one of the aspects of St. Teresa's mystical religious experience was that she suffered from these sharp pains. We don't know what it is. We don't know. They could maybe if they had her relics, they could figure it out. But it was some kind of some kind of experience where she had this excruciating pain. And she talked about this in a way it was really quite unusual. She said that that was a gift from God, that this was God causing her pain. And she accepted her pain. If this is what she had to go through to have this closeness to God, she was good with that. So here you go. You got an angel with a spear and you see it says, the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And this is it right here. You can see this is her face. This is what's going on. And it's kind of, kind of a, it's kind of two sides of the coin here because she is suffering pain and it's called an ecstasy. And it's basically that she's turning this pain into ecstasy, that she sees this as being closer to God. I know this is kind of a kind of a deep, kind of profound way of looking at things. But at any rate, she is a very, very honored saint in the Catholic tradition. Uh, and so much has been said about this, and you can see what, what Bernini is doing here. And this is what it looks like, what we would say in situ, in its environment. And there's the rays, there's the angel with the spear, there's St. Teresa. And scholars have written about this, this sculpture a lot. And they talk about the ecstasy of St. Teresa as though... This sculpture is so lifelike that you could almost hear her moan the way that, that Bernini has portrayed her. Well, that may, that you may agree with that or not, but what's happening as an overall aesthetic, as an overall goal of all of these artists, Pope wants the most grandiose capital for Catholicism, people like Bernini, they have this idea of introducing theatrics into the art. And I might add that Baroque, for a lot of scholars, actually is synonymous with theatrical sculpture and painting. And we'll see some more examples of that, but this is this is action. This is this is theater, and it's all in the same stage set. And I want to show you something else here too. Here, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit. Now there is Saint Teresa, but along the sides. These guys, we started to see this in the Renaissance. We started to see this in both Northern Renaissance and in Southern Renaissance. We saw Masaccio's crucifixion. And alongside on the bottom were the two donors. We saw the Marode altarpiece, which had the Annunciation of the Virgin, Joseph on one panel outside the space that Mary the Virgin occupies. And on the other side, two people sort of knocking on the door. They were the donors. That's what's happening here. 
These are the donors. The people that help pay for this very expensive statue. And you see here they are, and it's actually like uh, box seats. Right there. In, in, and here's a close-up of this, too. Um, and you can see, these guy, this guy here is watching the activity. He's always watching a play. These guys are discussing, oh, loftier things. Bottom line, these are the donors. And it's so theatrical that you actually have a load. You have box seats. You have spectators. And so uh, this sculpture for a lot of people is like the most represent most representative of Baroque art. Now we've got some other, we have some other examples here. And you can see the, the painting up here on top. Let me zoom in on that too. Um, and the angels and the Holy Spirit and, you know, theatrical, busy, theatrical, ornate. And this is like, this is almost like polar opposite from what you would find in Northern Christianity, Reformation Christianity. Because they were a lot more austere. They were much, they would say this was extravagant. They would say this was a big waste of money. And in fact, if you got that kind of money, you should feed the poor and stuff like that, you know. But they thought, and oh, and another zoom in on, that's on both sides here too. We got some more spectators on, on there. So anyway, that's what, what this is, I mean, and look at the, the, the marble, the brass, the, I mean, no bit of this seems to be untouched. And so that's going to be something that, that'll persist for a while in architecture. And oddly enough, the exteriors of these buildings are by comparison much more austere, much more controlled, much more toned down. And they'd like to use as much as possible the elements of classic architecture. And so they have the triangular pediment right out of Greek architecture, the columns with the Corinthian capitals on them. Uh, the archways, another impediment, but uh, another pediment, excuse me. And this kind of activity, the scroll. But in terms of ornamentation, it's nothing like what you see on the inside of these chapels. So, so they wanted to still keep one foot in the classical era. That's why we're seeing things like the obelisk from ancient Egypt. We see a lot of references to classical Rome. And they're still speaking Latin, by the way. That's still the official language. Um, um, this is St. Peter's, and mind you, there's a lot of statuary going on on the top, but it's still kind of, still kind of classical, classical Greek, excuse me, classical Roman dome, classical columns, proportions, archways, and adorned with statues, and again, an obelisk. And there we go. Here's what we were talking about. St. Saint, Saint Peter's uh, uh, Plaza, Piazza, excuse me. 
And so Bernini, let me get back to him here. Bernini is like the major sculptor of the of the era. And he does something that we really hadn't seen so much of before. He could have been called Bernini Incorporated because he had a workshop. And he had a lot of artists working for him. And so a lot of these places all around Rome from that era, you see this archway, the Royal Stairway, uh, and this sculpture, this ornamentation, designed by Bernini and done in his workshop. And in fact, what we talk about a lot, and it's still a discussion among art historians, is trying to figure out which of the sculptures were truly a Bernini sculpture or was this done by an artisan. And so they adored everything with this kind of sculpture. And one of the things that arises in Rome at the time is fountains. They talk about you ever been to Rome, there's fountains all over the place. How were they able to do that? Well, have you guys heard of the aqueducts? They were still in use. The, the, the Romans built them and they were all like a thousand years old, 1500 years old, and they still worked. So Rome and some of these other places, but especially Rome, they still had a great fresh water supply. And so they built a lot of fountains and in those fountains are a lot of statues. Okay, and this is uh, some more Bernini and talking about how things are ornate and everything seems to be decorated. Check out these columns. They're twisted. They're spiral columns. So inside the church or inside the buildings, much more ornate than what you see typically on the outside. But um, this is in St. Peter's. Vatican, uh, Bernini, we've seen this theme before too. David, we've seen a number of Davids in Italian art so far. We start with the Donatello, came to um, a high point with Michelangelo's David, and this. David, of course, it still carries the same message as the other ones did, and that is that a place like Rome was still a city-state. It wasn't organized into Italy, and in fact, the Italian peninsula would not organize into a unified country until the 19th century. They stayed principally city-states. And so as such, they were the little Davids having to fight off the big organized countries, which were the Goliaths. And so anyway, that part of it, I want to show you this, though. This is like, this is theater, as I was saying. And we marveled at the idea that Donatello could do the weight shift in the, in the figure. This, David's like coiled. He's about ready to, he's about ready to throw that stone or sling that stone and kill the feared Goliath. And so it's almost like right at the point where potential energy is about to turn into kinetic energy. He said, he's ready to, he's ready to strike. 
this is in human form, but you know, you can see a lot of parallels in the animal world too. Like for instance, if you, God forbid, happen upon poisonous snake, what do they do? They coil up and they're ready to strike. It's that point where that potential energy might just turned in, might just turn into kinetic energy. That it's a millisecond. And that's really this. And this that's part of the theatrics. It wouldn't be enough for David to be standing there with his pouch full of stones and his sling over here. It's got to be, it's got to be action. Same way to would talk about this, action, theater, movement. Uh, and in this case, it's that angel about ready to spear St. Teresa right there in the side with that excruciating pain. And so, again, these guys were not above references to the classical world. Apollo and Daphne. And this is right out of ancient Rome. This is right out of um, it's right out of the classical world. And Oh, I forget. I was just looking at this the other day. It's a it's a love story, and Apollo is in love with Daphne here. But once he makes the advance to her, she turns into a tree because of her magic shenanigans. It's part of the mythology. But bottom line, they didn't they didn't bat an eye. Using classical architecture. Bless you. You okay? You good? You need some water or something. Take care of it. Yeah, good. So anyway, bottom line, they, you know, have an obelisk and stuff like that. Didn't bat an eye. They kind of looked at things that this was part of a continuum. Ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and this high point, Christianity, the Baroque era. Now, again, I refer back to Northern countries, the Reformation, Protestants, Oh, by the way, I don't know if you've ever picked up on this, but Protestant, what's the root word? Protest. They were protesting against all of this in Catholicism. It was all part of that big breakup. I showed you last week the indulgences that they had a lot of problems with, but there were a lot of very fundamental ways of looking at Christianity that they wanted to have a part of. And they, in the North, basically looked at a lot of this stuff as being pagan, pagan and pre-Christian. And uh, these guys embraced it. And they have been. They had been for a long time. It was part of the Renaissance. And here's a, uh, another Bernini, and I was talking about this just a moment ago about the fountains and here it is there's a Bernini fountain with all of all of the sculpture and oh another obelisk they would embrace this and the idea of uh, the fountain of the four rivers hey aqueduct time uh, and at the right the detail of the grotto looking east and and in the background Borromini back in here. Borromini is another architect of the time. Bernini did architecture, did mostly did sculpture and here's what that fountain looks like 
and the detail. And it looks like something right out of ancient Rome. Uh, and Borromini, I was talking to just mentioned him a moment ago. He was like a major architect of the time. And mostly when we're looking at his work, we're looking at the exterior of buildings. But one of the things that kind of gets introduced into this mix of classicism is a new element, and that is the curvilinear. We start to see that appear in a lot of the architecture. And you see here this balcony, and it is. It's a curvilinear balcony. The rest of this, you could pull right out of ancient Rome, but not that. And there's something up here too. The oval, prior to this time, they, they, the Romans and the Italians, I should say in general, they really admired the geometry of ancient Greece and Rome. So you'll see a lot of circles, a lot of triangles, and a lot of squares. They love this geometry. And they thought of geometry as its own truth, mathematics as truth. And in the Baroque era, we start to see this introduced, which is kind of a whole different geometric idea, the oval. And I went to a conference one time and, and I listened to a presenter doing a so, who was doing research on this very building. And uh, she talked about the age of the Baroque in terms of, we could call it the age of the oval. The oval starts to appear in a way that we haven't seen this in any of the architecture or any of the sculpture before. And the other thing we start to see too is this kind of ornamentation that almost looks like it's, how should I say it? This almost looks like it's uh, ornamentation that could have been made out of cloth or something else. I'm back up a little bit here to point to this one. Yeah, see, like these scrolls, that's like, that's, not functional. That's the idea of a scroll kind of starts to refer to or sort of an idealized version of paper. And and literature and, and you find this in sheet music and stuff like that. And so we see a lot of things start to appear in the art and the architecture. And here is Another shot of this uh, San Carlo Alle Quattro Fontaine. Uh, and this is what it looks like from the front. And the predominant oval. And on the inside, the oval. Borromini is like the guy that introduces the oval and it kind of sticks around for a long time. Uh, inside of the dome of the building when we just, when we saw the front of us. And so anyway, yeah, all of this rigid triangle, square, circles, change. Uh, and this, another Borobini. Uh, and again, curvilinear, we start to see that appear. And, and like I say, these things all kind of function on a number of levels. And one, it kind of talks to or speaks to how they are perceiving the ancients and how they're trying to move forward with some of those ideas. Um, another aspect of that is that they see this whole thing 
as technologically possible. And so you might kind of figure that like cutting stone into these ever tightening circles to stack the stones upon is much, much more challenging than putting together blocks and cylinders and pyramids. So this kind of shows where they were at in terms of engineering as well. And talking about engineering, check this out. The interior of a dome. It's no longer just good enough to have a dome, but to have something that is very geometrically incredible. They had the wherewithal, they had the math, and it is, again, as I started talking about Bernini and Pope and rebuilding Rome, the source, it was a display of power. It was a source of pride. It was a statement. This is the true Christian belief. And so anyway, uh, curvilinear, whoa, we're talking, we're getting it all over the place here. And so not everything in painting follows quite the same sort of rules. Annabelle Karachi, Light in Egypt. And this is, if you know the Christian uh, story of Jesus, this is where Jesus, Mary, and Joseph have to flee because Herod is killing all of the male babies. So they escape the persecution. And so this is something like what you see in Northern Europe, bottom line, this kind of pastoral scene, this connection with nature. But, oh, this is what I want. But what you will see in a lot of paintings will be references to the ancients. And so what we have here are, is an ancient city. You see well over here, the camels and the traders and things. Um, Joseph, old, very old. There's a purpose for that. And so the flight into Egypt, and they're still building on some of the same ideas ceiling frescoes, organized in a different way than what Michelangelo would have done. But the idea of painting scenes on the ceiling of, and check this out. This is about as pagan as you can get. The half goat, half man. Uh, I'm trying to remember, it's not a centaur, maybe. Anyway, bottom line, it's out of Greek mythology. And, and a lot of these scenes are right out of ancient times. It wasn't, it wasn't forbidden. In fact, it was encouraged. Panabrism, talked about that last time. Dark modeling, a dark space behind the figures, pushes the figures up. There's another thing that makes tenebrism fit the artistic goals of the time. And that is this dark background actually allows the painter to enhance the theatrical. the theatrical activity inside the painting. Why is that? Well, the dark pushes the figures forward. And secondly, the dark background doesn't distract 
if you were paint a landscape back there, that might kind of draw your attention away from what was going on here. Uh, this, these are musicians, and this guy is Caravaggio, and he's the guy that actually owns Tenebrism. In fact, it starts to become known as Caravaggio's. And so, again, this is like something that could have been ancient Greece and Rome. I mean, guys playing a uh, musical instrument, reading music, it's Caravaggio, Calling of St. Matthew, we have here. You guys know about St. Matthew. One of the 12 disciples, and he was called to be a disciple, one of the 12 apostles, and he was a tax collector. And that's what's happening here. Um, you see the money? Uh, zoom in on it. See, gosh, man. And I gotta make sure I got my share. And so zoom in. See, there's all the money is a tax collector. They're all pointing to him. And he's getting called out. You, you tax collector. You should be following Jesus, not Caesar. And this light coming in from the window, kind of like how we've been seeing this symbolic light inspiration, divine inspiration. And so, and so this is Caravaggio. This may be his most famous work, and it's huge. It's seven and a half feet high, almost six feet wide. So it's like a, it's like from here in the ceiling, you know, bottom line. The conversion of St. Paul. Another story about the life of Christ. St. Paul becomes a disciple of Jesus. Unlike Matthew, this guy's a Roman soldier. And he's on horseback and he is struck by lightning. And he takes that lightning strike as... A sign they should be following Jesus. Saw the light, if you will. But we got all of the tenebrism here that I've been talking about. Second is that this is a big painting, but if you were to see this um, in the Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome, you would know that St. Paul's head is about at eye level to the viewer. So not only is St. Paul looking up at the heavens, he's on his back and he's looking up. We are looking up too, which is really kind of another twist. It, it's kind of a, a breakthrough in Italian painting. And so Caravaggio, drama, as I was talking about, theater, drama, the dramatic, entombment, very much about theater, emotion, act activity, and so on. Again, not an idealized situation. We don't see Christ as really not being dead, but Resurrecting, no, this is entombment. This is this is his dead body after the brutal crucifixion he had undergone. And so the taking of the Christ. This is from the Garden of Gethsemane. 
this is right after the Last Supper, and they went to pray. Judas betrays Christ, kissing him on, I'll identify him for you. I'll give him a kiss on the cheek, and here are the Roman soldiers right there to arrest Christ. But it's so dark, very theatric, and it's a very dark point in the history of Jesus. It's a kind of a kind of a dark day for for humanity in its own way. And so we see all of that contrast, that light, and you see this Roman soldier looks probably a little bit more like a knight from the Middle Ages, but we see the shine on the armor. He's about ready to take him in. And Caravaggio had a number of students. One of his most famous students, another woman artist. As I say, we start to see more and more women artists in European art. It's a slow and steady move towards allowing women to participate. But she was a student of Caravaggio. And you see the basic tenebrism, the Caravaggioism that I've been talking about. And Judith slaying Holofernes. This is from the Old Testament. Judith was um, female, you bet, uh, famous military leader. Holofernes was the antagonist, the bad guy. And basically what Judith said was, let me sneak in the whole of Bernie's camp and while he's sleeping, I'll kill him. And she did, she cut his head off. He was decapitated, that's what this is. A lot of people call this uh, Judith and her maidservant too. That's another name if you ever run into it. But again, the, the drama, the theater, the activity, catching, catching actions, catching activity, catching the moment when things happen. You see, she just continued. And again, this is a pretty large scale painting too. I got another Artemisia here. Um, self-portrait as the allegory of painting. A lot of the same lights and darts. By the way, somebody made a movie titled Artemisia, and it's about her life. Actually, I think it came out about 10, 15 years ago. Amongst us, Art nerds, we saw that as a kind of a really cool thing. Not a big box office hit, but a lot of these, a lot of these things historically, um, big part of history. Guido Reni, uh, again, another ceiling fresco, Aurora, another reference to ancient mythology. Uh, Pietro da Portona. You see what they can do by this time. We saw, oh, uh, we saw these things of uh, people painting height in the Renaissance. But they've really kind of perfected all of that. They really quite literally, he quite literally, makes the ceiling disappear. And this is a classic example 
of being able to render human proportions and doing, how should I say this? When we talk linear perspective, we talk a horizon line and vanishing points and everything kind of conforms to our notions or how we see space. You can make believable space. Well, things happen a lot differently when you look up. Our frame of reference changes. And so a lot of those same rules that will get you a good, believable illusion of three-dimensional space and depth it doesn't work that way. So this shows you how scientifically and artistically they figured all of this out. And uh, another ceiling fresco. And as you might be saying, it, that's kind of uh, what the church is up to. And the glorification of St. Ignatius. You might know St. Ignatius. Oh. Well, he was one of the early Christians, and they put him in the Colosseum to be eaten by wild animals, lions. Except he stood there and he didn't do anything, and the wild animals refused to eat him. He was one of the early Christians, and that was seen as divine. Um, anyway. We we'll finish up today by showing you what was going on in Spain. In Spain, they don't really have the same kind of situation. Spain was becoming, in this era, a world power. By this time, 1603, Spain had pretty much colonized much of South America, Middle America, Spain. And other parts of, I mean, Mexico and other parts uh, of the desert southwest and going up. And so, anyway, they're kind of different. But this still life with game fowl, got fruit, vegetables, cabbage, stuff. And just like Van Eyck. I showed you some of the orange peelings or the oranges up on the windowsill and things. The idea that these people would paint perishable subjects, food, flowers, all these, these birds, they, they're not going to last long. You got to, you got to clean them and cook them because they will be rotten before much longer. You know, that's what happened in Northern Europe. Well, Spain conquered North, Northern Europe for a while. They had influence in Northern Europe and they really learned from those very same painters we looked at. Like, and so, um, and so a lot of what they do starts to look a lot like Roman painting and art, and a lot of it starts to look like Northern, Northern and Italian. And so here we go. This is another very dramatic, very theatric Martyrdom of St. Philip. We've seen a lot of martyrdom here. Uh, St. Serapion. Basically, like Caravaggio. High contrast, high theater, drama, dark background. Battle of Demons and Angels. And this is like something out of Northern Europe too, where they like to carve wood and paint and gild it. Gild it means they put gold leaf on it. 
And so anyway, it's kind of a combination of, of what's going on in Northern Europe and what's going on in Italy. And their main artist of the Baroque era is this guy, Diego Velazquez, water carrier of Seville. We talked about some painting commonplace people, not nobles, not saints, regular people. And this guy, he's as regular as you get. Clothes are a little tattered, water carrier. Means he has a kind of a low position in the social hierarchy. Kind of Protestant in that sense. Diego Velasquez, Christ on the Cross, again, theatrical, dark background, high contrast. And so, yeah, well, we see, we'll see a lot of Velasquez because he is really the preeminent painter in Spain at this time. And he was the court painter for Prince Philip IV, our King Philip IV in Spain. And there he is doing portraits. We saw that with Hans Holbein and Henry VIII, court painters painting royal subjects. And this is considered to be the master work of Velazquez. Las Meninas, the Maids of Honor. And it's big, like a lot of these, 10 feet, 5 inches by 9 feet. Huge scale painting. And what this is, this is what's going on inside the royal court. And this is kind of an exercise in trying to figure out where Velasquez is and how he's seeing all of this and exactly what's going on. By that, I mean, we don't know if this is a mirror and that this is the king and queen and they're sitting and standing in our space. We think that's the case, maybe not. We know this is Velasquez himself. And this is the back of the painting. You see he has his brush in his hand. And you see what's going on here, the princess and her attendants. And so we have these people all part of the royal court, um, the dog, and somebody back here, we think maybe the king, we have a nun and and it, we don't know who that figure is, but there's there's the sister, and everybody would be pretty much even the royal court would have their own clergy right there. But at any rate, this was seen as kind of a, a optical jigsaw puzzle, if you will, that you don't know exactly where you're standing, and is the king and queen standing in our space, or is you know, just different kinds of ways to read this. Uh, but the idea, this is probably the most important part of this, he's painting the royal family like regular people. He's given us an unvarnished, if you will, look at what's going on inside the royal court where we have this little girl and all of the people attending to her and stuff and the pet dog and the little boy over here and just, that's not how royalty had been portrayed. They were always kind of posed, kind of stately, kind of like this, typically, and this, this look like regular people. And that was, quite unusual. And there have been people that thought that uh, maybe uh, Velasquez uh, was really taking quite a risk in portraying the royals in this manner. And so uh, have a little uh, architecture. What happens is, as I was saying, this is built in Mexico City, 15, 
73 horse had continually added on for 150 years or so, 250. Bottom line, it's the first thing we've seen in the Americas. And again, the idea of Spanish culture, the idea that by this time, Spanish were building major cities in what was at the time called the New World. Victor. Got this one going. Victor. Anyway, you see, they do. They come in and they build their cities. This is in Peru, and that's kind of it. And that is the Baroque, theatrical, cannibalism, kind of austere on the outside, curvilinear, architecture, ornate, overly ornate to the point of decadence on the interiors in the architecture, but theatrical, the buzzword. So if it's not Baroque, and so that's really what I had for you today I wanted to get into some other things but I wanted to have some time if you guys had any questions any more questions about the quiz in that case I'll see you guys on Wednesday mm -hmm. Lizzie, what up? Uh, on Monday, I'm not in day class. I'm going to be returning to the weekend. Um, so I can try and zoom in the list and all. Um, but I don't know how well my connection will be in the car. So Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be posting it online okay. in the media gallery, too. So. Okay. I just want to let you know I will be in class. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. You bet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get up a little closer. Oh. Um, you said it's okay to change the artwork that we're doing for the quiz as long as it's in the textbook, right? As long as it's in the textbook, absolutely. All right, I only found one source for the one that I did the thing. Yeah, I didn't think that would happen, but and it was something I'm going to talk about on Wednesday. This is kind of what happens with research. You know, sometimes, sometimes you can find it. Sometimes not, you know. Yeah. So anyway, it's all part of the part of the process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well.